Oh, good. We got a good picture. And the birds are coming through good. Good evening. This is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. Uh, this is our second program for today. This is April 12th, 2015. We're with a live Bible study on iBlog.tv and at the same time making a recording of our Bible study starting this afternoon. It's 5 o'clock on the West Coast. And most of our people, well, I'm looking at uh, three from the Central Time Zone, and I'm looking at um, Eastern Time, and we're Western Time out here. We're beginning on the 12th chapter. This morning, we did a bilingual study. Basically, on the fact that Paul was referring to worship. But we'll read those two verses, and then we'll get on with the rest of the study. We might even finish the chapter today. If not, we will come so close to it. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. You worship God when you present to him your bodies. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Have you all ever heard the statement, the perfect will of God and the permissive? will of God there is a difference uh, there are things God wants us to do just like sometimes we want our spouses our children our parents our friends to do our bosses the people who work for us and then there's things that it isn't what we really want but it would be okay. And we can be in God's perfect will. And he has blessed me so much a part of my life when everything has always worked out. Working among very poor people, living off offerings taken in a revival meeting, and having every bill paid. We didn't live extravagantly, but the, the trailer bill, the car payment, everything paid when it was due. Didn't have a lot of money, but didn't owe anybody any money. And we're always in God's perfect will. Then there are people that perhaps should be in the ministry, but they're not. But they're not practicing sin. And God is permitting them to serve him that way, although he would prefer they do something else. If you can be in God's perfect will, that's where you're blessed. I, I can't imagine anybody ever living in God's perfect will and then being satisfied just to live in his permissive will. Now we talk about many gifts but one body. Just like one person has many parts to their body, the body of Christ is made up by many individuals and we're all different and we're all important. For by grace given to me, I tell everybody among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. God has given this much faith to one and this much to another. And this much, it, God has given different things 
to different people. Let's go back to something I think is so important, so important to the Apostle Paul, so important to the people who lived during that particular time in history, so important to us. And that is not to convince ourselves that we're all that. did a program one Sunday morning not too many Sundays ago on qualifications for being a servant. Uh, we ministers are called servants of God, and of course there's a whole lot of Christians that would like to remind us constantly, we're servants. Don't climb too high. Don't get too big. Don't get too much money. <laughs> don't get to thinking you're too important. Some would like to put us down um, however it's not what other people think about us that's important it's what we think about ourselves it is if we think we're hot stuff and God is so lucky to have us serving him then we're in trouble. And Paul ought to know. Paul suffered some type of an illness. A thorn in the flesh. Three times he asked God to heal him of it. And God said, no. This is to keep you from thinking of yourself more highly than you should. If other people are blessed by your ministry and other people say, you know, you're really a blessing. That's one thing. If any of us, in any level of ministry or service, begins to think, whew, I'm really something. And I've seen people that way. And not only did Solomon say it in the Proverbs, but other teachers in the Bible have said the same thing. You get to thinking, you're all that. Pride goes before a fall. And when any Christian falls or has a moral failure or is a disappointment in his or her serving the Lord, we'll say, oh, well, he, he fell in love with the wrong woman. Or, well, she just loved music too much. Or, no, it's not that. Those things are the result. The cause is thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. Instead, think sensibly. As God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, we have many parts in one body, and all parts do not have the same function. I have a nose, I have two ears, I have two eyes. I have two feet, you know, we all have more or less the same parts. Each part doesn't do the same thing. Yeah, you know, I've had a problem for a few months with my ears. Uh, as you get older, you get arthritis in different parts. I've had arthritis in a lot of places. I didn't even know one time how, how the arthritis in, I don't know which, like, was it this right there? Anyway, I was watching a video of myself playing the organ, and I said, hmm, I didn't know I had arthritis in that joint. Uh, the older you get, the more joints affected, and I just got a couple of joints affected the last month that had never bothered me before. Uh, so we have a lot of parts. They don't all do the same thing. We need them all. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts don't have the same function, in the same way, we, who are many in the body of Christ, and individually members of one another, I'm a member of the body of Christ, you all are a member of the body of Christ, and individually we're members of one another.
we may be members of the same Bible study. We might be members of the same uh, group. We might be members of the same church. One way or another, we're all members of the same body of Christ. That being true, accordingly, uh, we're members, uh, according to the grace given to us, we have many different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the standard of faith. Usually when the Bible speaks about prophecy in our day and age, it's talking about preaching. Uh, the actual meaning of the word means to foretell or foretell. To foretell would be to tell the future, which a lot of Old Testament prophets did. To forth tell is to tell people things forcefully in such a way that they understand that they need to hear what they're being told. And that part of forth telling we think of as preaching. Could be thought of as teaching. It's a little different. They don't have, our parts don't have the same function. And we have different gifts. If the gift is prophecy, use it according to the standard of faith. God has certain requirements for the people he calls to preach. If service, in service, that's use that gift of service, according to the gift he's given us. If it's an exhortation, that's sort of like preaching, but more like advice giving along with it, then do it with generosity. Don't do it that way, but with a great deal of love and understanding. If it's in leading, leading other people, being a leader of a group, do it with diligence. Do it. Do a good job of doing it. Don't just show up and be there, but do it well. Showing mercy with cheerfulness. Now he talks about Christian ethics. Have you ever heard of medical ethics? Uh, the American Medical Association has a board of ethics. Is it ethical for a doctor to tell a relative of a sick person about their disease? Is it ever ethical for the doctor not to tell the patient that they're dying in order to save them perhaps from fear? Is it, is it ever correct? Is it ever ethical? There are other problems with other situation in ethics with psychologists, psychiatrists, with teachers, with the uh, criminal justice system. Well, this is Christian ethics. Love must be without hypocrisy. Remember the old, uh, in, in the New Testament, those old hypocrites that would pray long prayers, but not at home behind closed doors. They would pray them in the middle of the street. 
And if the organization they belong to said you pray at 8 in the morning and 12 at noon and 4 in the afternoon, oh, they would be watching their clocks. And when it was time to pray, they would be right out in the middle of Main Street and First, <laughs> where there were a lot of people. And they would make sure that the whole world knew they were praying. Love must be without hypocrisy. If you love, you love. But don't be a hypocrite about it. Detest evil. If something is wrong, it's wrong. You can talk yourself out of it. I don't care what it is. Somebody's going to be able to put some fancy sounding words to it and make it sound different than what it is. If something is good, cling to it. Grab onto it. If it's good, hang on to stuff that's good. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. <laughs> no, sorry about that. One of our uh, guests on the live program uh, apparently has or wants to talk about uh, something. No. Nope. It wasn't me. <laughs> uh, he says, treat each other the way you would treat your brother. Our brothers and our sisters are members of the same family. We have the same father and mother. We were raised the same way. We should understand each other. And if we can understand this, then perhaps we can have the same kind of friendship or honesty with other people, especially other brothers in Christ, uh, even though we're not really related to them. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's letting somebody eat first. Or if you've got a cantaloupe or a huge burger, <laughs> the kind that has one thing stacked on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. You've heard that one person should do the cutting and then the other person takes the same choice. Because if the person who does the cutting picks his piece first, he might get the biggest piece. But you get the person that cuts the best when you get the person, one person's going to do the cutting in half. That person, if he doesn't get to pick first, that person's going to make sure that that thing is cut exactly in half. Show honor. Let the other person go first. Let the other person sit down first. Outdo each other in showing honor. Do not lack diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be glad for another person. That's good things are happening to for a chance. Be patient in affliction. All of us from time to time are going to go through, some are going to, of us are going through from time to time big problems. Others are going through smaller problems. You ever seen two people or three people talking and they're trying to outdo each other? Yeah, well, I went to the doctor and he said things didn't look good. Oh, well, I went and my doctor said I, I had better be, you know, catching up with my bills and getting my business taken care of. Yeah, well, my doctor told me I had better go down and buy a plot at the local cemetery. You know, we just got to outdo each other on how good we are or how uh, much we're suffering and deserving of compassion. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 
rejoice in hope. Another person's got good news or is hoping for things to get better, be happy for them. Instead of always one-upmanship, always being a little bit better for me. Yeah, uh, one of our folks are making a comment that, you know, somebody treated them nice in church, but not all that nice in a store or somewhere else. Trying to act like good Christians where the other people were watching them, but in a place that it didn't make any difference. I, I totally understand that. Share with the saints in their need. If other people need something, come on. You can share what you have. Now, this is not uh, a lack of understanding people who are I'm looking for in my mind I'm trying to find a good word and, and it's the right word is not coming up there are people who take advantage of Christians there are people who pretend not to have any money in order to beg uh, there are people who could work but don't because let's face it, it takes more effort to get up and go to work. We don't all wake up every day feeling great. It takes effort. A lot easier just to lay there and see yourself as sick and, and expect Christians to take care of you. I pastored a church here on the mountain for a few years. It was an English-speaking church, and as you know, most of my ministry is in Spanish. I was so surprised when it came around Christian people, Christmas, people I'd never heard of would be calling, what's your church doing for the poor this, this Christmas? Do you know, I, I found out something that, that year that I didn't know before, because I was also uh, helping a, a charity, uh, because we had a lot of Spanish-speaking people, and we didn't have uh, anybody within the charity, uh, or the charity of, of needs of people here that live on the mountain who spoke Spanish. So I spent a lot of time with them too. I found out that all the different organizations who give to others at Christmas had to get together to protect ourselves from all the people. They thought they were going to each one of us and saying, well, nobody's helping us out. If you don't help me out, my kids aren't going to have Christmas. They were going to the fire department and telling them that. <laughs> they were going to another charity and telling them that. They were going to another one and telling them that. And I was rather surprised. I shouldn't have been surprised. I mean, I, I had no experience in this type of thing. I had never, um, well, I had pastored a church before. I had... Uh, been a church planter, but I did. I just didn't have this experience. I I should have had. It should have been surprising to me. But there are people that as long as you'll give to them, they won't work. And the funny thing is that if they ever have anything, they don't give to anybody else. Now we do have to be smart enough to protect ourselves from people like that, because we shouldn't take from our children. From our family, yes, we should share what we have, but not be so dumb as to give to somebody who doesn't have because they figure, well, why should I work if you give me things without my working? So we have to be wise. We have to be loving. We have to be giving. But we also have to be smart enough not to have advantage taken of us. I learned a lot those few years that I passed around this mountain. Um, rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. 
persistent in prayer, share with the saints in the days right after the resurrection of Jesus and before uh, the uh, Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, during that time, they referred to each other as saints. Other people referred to them as people who were in the way. One of these Bibles that I used this morning, it was the Catholic, this way, I think it's called the way. Yeah. One of these Bibles is called the way. Other people refer to them, those people that are in the way. What way? The way of Christ. So non-Christians refer to believers as those who are in the way. And believers refer to each other's as saints and those saints who died were referred to as those who were asleep because they'd been taught and they believed that one day soon Jesus would come to take the saints and we believe the same thing what we didn't know it was there a period of time in between. They just thought it was going to happen right away. And they knew that those who had died would go first and then those that were alive. So those that had died were referred to as those who were asleep. They were asleep in Christ. They weren't dead because when Jesus came, they were going. They were going to move. As a matter of fact, they would go first. And then finally, in a town by the name of Antioch, somebody started calling them Christians, Christ followers. But those are some of the names that they used. Share with the saints. Bless those that persecute you. You know, it's, it's easy to be nice to people that treat you nice, isn't it? It's easy to be patient with people who are patient with you. It says, rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Sometimes somebody just needs their arms put around them. You don't need to say a word. I had a woman who's a neighbor and a friend. She was over here. Um, if they're having work done on their home, they're part-time mountain livers. They have a home somewhere else. And uh, about 50-60% of us that live in Lake Arrowhead live here all the time. And then the rest are either celebrities, but there are people who aren't celebrities, like my friend and my neighbor also. So if she's having work done on her home, she has to come up here and be here. You have workers in your home, you've got to be here. So she was here for a while, even though her husband was in the other home. And I remember one time we got bad news while she was in my home. And we were standing at the door. She was getting ready to go out the door. And she just threw her arms around me and held on to me. She just needed a long hug. And sometimes that's all it takes. You don't need words. Words are hard to come by. Um, you just need to know that somebody's there for you. I see we have um, some more guests that have come in. I don't know whether you know that I'm also broadcasting or making a video on uh YouTube of our same lesson. So if I don't chat with you a whole lot right now, as soon as I get through with this lesson, I will chat with you. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been here before, and I probably know who you are. 
but you've come on as a guest and I see you just as a number. But some of you, this might be your first time. Uh, if so, hang out, see if you like us, see if, um, you know, you're welcome to be with us. Everybody's welcome until they make themselves unwelcome. And for that, I have Larry, my super operator. But we don't have that happen very often because most people are respectful, if not of me, at least of the word of God. But I want to say to our guests on the live show, you're welcome to be here. I hope you enjoy yourself. We go through the Bible. We have been through it once already. This is my ninth year doing this. And we are halfway through the New Testament and about um, about halfway through the Old Testament, about two-thirds of the way through the New Testament, our second time through. So rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Be in agreement with uh, each other. Instead of fussing and fighting and wanting your way, once in a while say, okay, we'll do it your way. You don't have to have your own way all the time. Sometimes it's not even really important. Sometimes it's just nice to somebody to say, okay, we'll do it your way. Share with the saints in their needs. If maybe they're not having a good week, and maybe it's it's an occasion when you take your kids out for a McDonald's chocolate sundae double. It's an extra 40 cents to get chocolate on the top and chocolate on the bottom. Maybe this is a good week to take their kids. Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. Sometimes you just need to know that somebody else cares. Be in agreement. Don't be proud. Oh, I got a newer car than you got. Bless people, don't curse them. I'm amazed at the lack of language that some people have. It's like they can't get through a paragraph without using words that we use by the first letter only because it's not nice to use the whole word. Like, we are so ignorant that we don't know enough language. We don't know enough words that we can say the whole word. We have to resort to words that we use only by the first letter of the word. Be in agreement. Associate with the humble. Be a friend to somebody that doesn't have as nice a car as you have. Be a friend to somebody that doesn't have a friend. And if they don't have a friend, there may be a reason. It may be they're not too cool to be with, but come on. God's blessed you. It's not going to hurt you to show a little friendliness. Associate with the humble. Can a person who's poor count on you as a friend? Or can only person, people of your own class count on you as a friend? Do not be wise in your own estimation. That means you're smart because you think you're smart. Do not repay evil for evil. You smack me, I'll smack you back. You do something mean to me that gives me the right to do something mean to you. No, that's not the way to live. You lower yourself to somebody else's level. That makes you somebody. I don't think so. Don't repay evil for evil. Try to do what's honorable in everybody's eyes. Not just, well, it's right because I say it's right. No, it's right because we all know it's the right thing to do. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everybody. Now, there are people you can't live in peace with. There are. They're ornery. They don't cooperate. 
they want to get, they don't want to give. They want to be blessed. They don't want to bless anybody else. You can't live at peace with them. And I'm glad the Apostle Paul recognized that and wrote that in here. Because there are people who will go to a church. Now, you go to a church doesn't mean you walked into a building of perfect people. If you come to my show, as opposed maybe to a music show or um, a chat show, or it doesn't mean you walked into a program full of perfect people. It means you came into a show where people are interested in hearing what the Bible has to say. We're not perfect in here. We just care about each other, and we care about the Lord, and we care about the Bible. But there are people that will say, oh, you people in this world, you're Christians, huh? Well, then you need to give me, you need to do for me, you need to help me. There are people that will try to take. And that's the hardest part of the job that I have to do sometimes, to say to somebody, you know. I have had to put somebody out of a church. Uh, I had a person who was uh, uh, many names, uh, I guess um, a drunk would be one of them, and she knew how long it took her to be wiped out drunk, flat on the floor drunk. And she would either bring it with her and drink on the way, or she knew when to drink it so that just about the time I get ready to preach, she's socked out and causing trouble. I have a problem. I told her, you can stop it, or I've got deacons that will accompany you to the door. And if that doesn't work, I told one of my deacons when I went to the church, they had only a corded phone. And I brought a phone from home that was cordless. And I said to one of the ushers, Go to my office and bring me a phone. I don't want my deacons or ushers to do my job. Somebody needs to be escorted to the door. Or if we need a public servant as an escort, I'll be the one to, to call 911. I don't want other people to do that. As a leader, it's my job. Bring me the phone. I'll make the phone call. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are people who will take advantage of the fact, not that you're perfect, but that you're trying. That you want to be helpful. You want to be a blessing. There are people that will take advantage of that. It's very hard to say no to them. And they're the first ones that say, well, you're not real Christians because you don't give me things I want. <laughs> you know, my if, if, if you don't do what I want you to do, my kids ain't going to have Christmas. No. You drank away your government check by the 10th of the month. And Christmas comes on the 25th. That's why your kids aren't going to have Christmas. It's hard to be a Christian leader and to have to put people in their place. But just like God wants you and I to be the very best we can, there's another, another one running around that some people paint his picture uh, with a tail. <laughs> and he's got people trying to be just the opposite of how God wants us to be. And we have to deal with it. Try to do what's honorable in everybody's eyes. We're not going to please everybody. You're right, Granny. God doesn't expect his children to be a doormat. But there are those, you know, most of you probably have a, a Facebook account. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing the people that tell the church what they ought to do with all this money we collect every Sunday. Have you all seen how much money I've collected every Sunday? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they know exactly what we ought to do with it. And none of them have ever contributed a quarter 
or a dime. They don't have 50 cent pieces anymore, do they? Uh, no, there are, there are those that want to interpret. Listen, this book was written to me. And I've got an interpreter that will help me interpret his word for me. I don't need somebody who doesn't love him, who doesn't love his word, tell his kids how to interpret his word. But there are going to be people around. And that's the hardest part of wanting to do the right thing. I got a phone call one time. I guess people figured if you called the preacher 10 minutes before church starts, the preacher's going to be there. <laughs> so I got a phone call. They wanted me to take in some woman that they were looking after for a while, and they weren't going to be home. They needed somebody to look after. Yeah, she was younger than me, stronger than me, healthier than me, recently out of jail. <laughs> But I, I, and I, guess what I was preaching that morning to Good Samaritan. And I thought, there are people I can't take in. I can't take in a guy down the street to share my home with me. Uh, but this is a woman for a short period. I could do that. It was just one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. Uh, but I was trying to do the right thing. We will be taken advantage of and we'll make mistakes. There will be times we will not properly judge the situation. But we need to be honest enough to know that we've made a mistake and to try to rectify it. I think one of the most beautiful things in the world, I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not, I think one of the most beautiful things in the world, this brings tears to my eyes, when a parent says to an adult child, I made mistakes raising you and I'm sorry. That is honesty right down in your innermost parts. Or when a boss or a pastor says, I made the wrong mistake. It didn't turn out like I expected it to. I'm sorry, please forgive me. When a person has done what at the moment they thought was the best, and it didn't turn out, but they're honest enough to admit it. That's how we need to be. We're not going to be perfect. Plus, we've got other people taking advantage of us. But, as he says, try to do the right thing. Try to do what's honorable in everybody's eyes, if possible, on your part. Live at peace with everybody, if possible. Because it's not possible, because some people have got their mind made up. They're not going to be at peace with anybody. And if they cross your path, it's going to be impossible to live at peace with them. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room. For his wrath, for it's written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your business to yourself. You don't have to discuss it with anybody. Leave it to God. He can straighten people out a whole lot better than I can. And he can do it in a way that they'll know they've been dealt with. So, not everybody we deal with is going to be reading what I've just read to you. And not everybody we have to deal with is going to try to live the way I'm telling you we should. But do your best to meet the rest of the Lord. It is written, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. But, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Okay. Hunger is a very hurtful feeling. 
if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals upon his head. You cannot straighten him out any better than feeding him when he's been nasty to you and giving him something to drink when he's been, he would not do it for you. So when you do that, you're being good to him. But in a sense, he's being punished. He's getting what he deserves. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. You, it can be done. It can be done. We have to work at it. Chapter 13. A Christian's duty to state, and I need a little bit more of um, my diet root there. Everyone must submit in the governing authorities. Um, Israel was under the authority of Rome. Rome had all the power. Israel had none. That's the reason the Jewish leaders had to lie about Jesus to get him punished and beaten and eventually uh, given death on the cross. Because they were powerless because the Romans were in charge. And God never said, well, you poor things. They're nasty authoritarians. You don't have to do what they say because they're not understanding. Yeah, you do. Wherever you have people living together, you've got to have some rules. And wherever you've got people in rules, you've got to have some in authority and power. And it's not always pleasant when they use their authority in a way that's not good, not pleasing to you. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. You know, we Americans feel very bad that in our lifetime there was slavery. I'm older than most of you. And I lived in the North. So I personally did not know about slavery, but I knew it existed. God and the apostles never said slavery is wrong. Don't cooperate with it. You know what the apostles said? And you're going to find this in this chapter. If you're a slave and you trust in Christ's shed blood on the cross for your salvation, be a good slave. Don't take more than your share when the slave owner isn't looking because he's, he's a slave owner and you're a slave. God never tried to wipe out slavery. He said if you're a slave be an honorable, born-again, Christian slave. If you are a slave owner, be an honorable, born-again, Christian slave owner. He didn't try to change the laws of other countries, only Israel. He didn't try to change them. And if Christians went there, obey the law. 
live the way a good Christian lives. All right. Submit to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except for God. The Lord is mentioned in more than one place in the Bible. Nobody's king if I don't allow it. Now, God may not have taken an active part in putting somebody on the throne. But if God doesn't want somebody on the throne, they're not going to be on the throne. And the very fact that somebody has a powerful position, God may not have put them there. But God could take them out in a minute, too. So he said, remember, if anybody's got authority, God has allowed them to have authority, or they wouldn't have it. For those that exist are instituted by God. So then, when one who resists authority is opposing God's command, somebody's got to be in charge. And who has the power to say, well, I'm going to obey that policeman, but I'm not going to obey this teacher. And I kind of like the mayor, so I'm going to do what he says. But that parking cop, I don't like him. I'm not going to obey him. See, we don't get to say, well, I get to honor the people I want to and obey the ones. No. If you're a Christian, obey the law. Vote. Go early. Vote only once. <laughs> so then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do good, and you'll have their approval. I'll tell you. Um... People, especially in a small town, I live in a small community. Um, I don't get out that much anymore at my age and as busy as I am. When I was younger and I was involved in more things like the fire safe community, how are we going, what, what plans are we going to make? Because when we have mountain fires, I have lived through three of them, two of them on this mountain. Uh, I was very involved. And people in town knew who I was. For government is God's servant to you for good. Somebody's got to be in charge. But if you do wrong, be afraid. Because it does not carry a sword for no reason. The cops are armed for a reason. <laughs> for government is God's servant. They are supposed to be looking out for us. Okay. I know they don't all look out for us the way they should. I know that. But that's what they're supposed to be doing. For government is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's not that way all the time. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your own conscience. It's the right thing to do. You think I don't know that you think I don't see the same videos on the evening news that you see? That many people take the power that government has given them and use it wrongfully? Of course I know that. This is the reason you pay taxes. Remember when, and I mention it from time to time, but when the people told Moses we want a king? And they said, you want a king? Your sons will be called into the army. You will pay taxes. The government will come and seize your land because they need it for a road or they need it for this, that, or the other. Up till now, when you needed something, you've said, God, we need this, and God takes care of it. You want to exchange that for a king, for a government? They said, yeah, and God said, okay. You'll be sorry, and they were. 
but you can't have a bunch of people living together and they all do what they want to do and nobody's in charge. And in order to have somebody in charge and all of this, it takes money. People are given power and not everybody can handle power. That's life. That's why. Wouldn't it be much better if we all left God in charge and we were all serving him? Yeah, but the people wanted to be like everybody else and they wanted a king and they got one. You must submit not only because of wrath, but because of your own conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes. Since the authorities are God's public services servants, continually attending to these tests, pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those that you owe taxes to. Tolls to those you owe bills for. Our gasoline costs so much money because we got state taxes. And we got state taxes to pay for keeping potholes out of the roads. So that the trucks that are delivering the groceries to the grocery store where I go and buy my groceries. So that those roads can be taken care of. We don't have ferries come in the night and, you know, take care of the roads. All that costs money. So you got a toll road, okay? You want to drive down this nice road, okay? Put some money in the toll road. It's, you know, it would have been so much better if they would have said, yes, Lord, we'll serve you. Tell us what to do, we'll do it. But they wanted to be like every other country. They wanted to have a government. They wanted to have a king. They got it. That's the way things work. And Paul is simply saying many, many years after uh, Moses, that's life. So pay taxes, pay tolls. Respect those that you owe respect to. And honor the people you owe honor to. Say yes, sir. Love is your duty. Don't owe anybody anything except love each other. That's a good law. Love each other. He said, here's some commandments. He's going to mention some of the ten. Remember I've told you in the past, we went from pages and pages and pages of law, and we reduced them to Ten Commandments. Now we come to the New Testament and Jesus himself reduces the ten to two. All the laws in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of those pages can be reduced to the Ten Commandments because they all either deal with you and God or you and people. Honor God. That has to do with your relationship with you and God. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That has to do with you and God. Don't want what belongs to your neighbor. That has to do with you and other people. Don't lie in court on other people. That has to do with you and other people. Pages and pages and pages of law come down to you and God or you and people. And they're reduced to Ten Commandments. Now they came to Jesus and Jesus said, yeah, you want to read me the law? I can reduce it to two commandments. One for you and God and one for you and people. As far as you and God, love the Lord God with your heart and soul. As far as you and your neighbor, treat him the way you want to be treated. That pretty much covers everything. He says, these are the commandments. Do not commit adultery. That's you and your neighbor. Do not murder. That's you and a neighbor. Do not steal. You and a neighbor. Do not covet. That you want something real bad. And if there's any other commandment, it's all summed up. 
by saying love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. If you love anybody as much as you love yourself, and hey, we love ourselves, don't we? We don't want to hurt. We don't want people to do bad stuff to us. We don't want to be hungry. We don't want to be cold. We don't want to be scared in the dark. Besides this, knowing that it's already the hour for you to wake up from sleep, for now is our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. If you think we were close to the rapture the day you said yes to Jesus, well, we're that much closer to the rapture now than we were then. The night is nearly over and the daylight is near. It's been dark for a long time. Pretty soon, it's going to be daylight. So we discard the deeds of darkness. And we put on the armor of light. We get ready to deal with light now because dark's going to be over with pretty soon. Not in carousing and drunkenness and sexual impurity and promiscuity. Not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. Make plans to serve God. And don't make plans just to do stuff because it pleases you. Now, we've done chapters 12 and 13. And now we are at chapter 14. So now it's time for some more diet ginger, uh, diet um, root beer. I'm out of root beer. I've got some lukewarm water on the other side of the room. I guess when we get through with chapter 14, I'll have to be Make a decision. The law of liberty. Accept everyone who is weak in the faith, but don't argue about doubtful issues. There are going to be people whose faith is not as strong as yours. And there are going to be people, that's what Paul said, I'm saying there is going to be people whose faith is stronger than yours, except that is a fact. Don't argue about doubtful issues. You know that I won't debate. And you know that there are people that come on the program and want to debate. Each one has a different line. I can see them coming. To debate, somebody usually wins. But nobody comes out on top. You win an argument, so what? You won an argument. Did you win a soul? You could prove that what somebody else was doing was not scriptural. Okay. Did they stop sinning? Did they start living for Christ because you and they argued? then why argue? A debate team in the university or college is, is like a football team. They, you got rules. And somebody wins the game. But when you win the game, did you have a revival meeting and win a lot of souls? Or do you just get to say, I won the game? And that's why I won't take God's word and argue over it. There was a time 60-some years ago that I did. It was being done in the Hispanic community in certain parts of the country. Churches would get together. They would advertise. It was like going to a, a concert or something. You'd fill up a church or a building and you had people arguing. And I was asked to argue for our side. 
um, we'd be in another town to preach a revival meeting and somebody would want me to debate. I have a dear friend, he's with the Lord now, he wrote a book on two different cults. He was very good at it. And we do need people to explain things to us that we don't understand because people will not come right out and tell us what they're really trying to pull. So we do need people to teach us and to instruct us. And all of that stuff is it's a good thing, but you don't win souls that way. See, we preached revival meetings and people got saved. People's lives were turned around. People that doubted God trusted him and were healed. People were blessed. That's what I do. That's what I'm called to do. I'm not called to argue with people. And so I don't because it's a time waster. And at the end, what have you accomplished? What have you accomplished? Oh, you were a better arguer than they were? Big deal. What have you accomplished? Are they now living for God because you debated with them? Do they now have enlarged faith because you debated them and you won? No. It, and so it, it does nothing except make enemies. So I choose like the Apostle Paul did. He said, I want, if somebody comes to Christ, I want it to be because the Holy Spirit brought them to the gospel, brought them to the cross, not because I'm such a good debater. So that's just one of the things I don't do. But you put yourself in a public thing like this on the Internet, and there will be people who, uh, but people have been, very good here to me and basically on, on all the networks that I've been people have kind of figured out that's what we do and and have cooperated boy these guys are really they are non-stop at whatever they're doing aren't they I just think they should be in nursing homes and hospitals and waiting rooms of all kind because you can't get better entertainment at this and it's not hurting anybody, and they're doing well, and they're happy. All right. He says, if there's any other commandment, it's all summed up by saying, love your neighbor. Here we go to chapter 14. Accept everybody who is weak in the faith, but don't argue about doubtful issues. One person believes he may eat anything, but one who is weak eats only vegetables. The one who is a vegetarian will tell you he's a better person because he doesn't eat meat. One person believes he may eat anything, but the one who is weak eats only vegetables. He will tell you he is a stronger person because he eats only vegetables, but he's given in to something. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. Let's go back to this one issue that Paul dealt with in the Corinthian church and in others also. Do we eat meat offered to idols? If I can go to the grocery store and get me at noon at 50 cents a pound good steak 50, good steak 50 cents a pound it's been unrefrigerated for three hours but I'm going to cook it and serve it to my family at night only one problem that three hours that it was unrefrigerated it was sitting in front of an idol Should I eat that meat? I get it cheaper. You know, you, you can get, you, you go to the supermarket every day and there'll be some that says, this is, 
this is good, but you got to eat it today. <laughs> Don't plan on having it tomorrow. This is good food if you eat it today. Well, in those days, people who worshipped idols would put food on the grave sites as an offering. That food still had protein. That food still had nutrients. It was just as good for you at noon as it was that morning before it sat before an idol. Ah, but there were people that said, you eat meat that sat in front of an idol? I thought you were a Christian. Well, what has what meat I eat got to do with me believing in Jesus for my salvation? Nothing. But somebody's going to come along and somebody's going to say, ah, you're a Christian and you eat meat that's sat in front of an idol. This is really ridiculous from where we stand because it's not part of the life that we live. But for the people that lived it at that time, it was a big deal. And we got other stuff in our life that's just a big deal. It's really silly. But people are going around making big deals out of silly stuff. It's called the law of liberty. Do I do something because I can? One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. And one who does not eat must not criticize one who does, because God has accepted him. If his sins are wiped away, why am I making it a big deal as to what he's eating for lunch? Who are you to criticize another's household slave? Well, I require my slave to wear rubber gloves and clean the toilets with Ajax. And what do you require your household slave to do? Do you realize how ridiculous some of this stuff can be? Who are you to criticize another's household slave? Before his own Lord, he stands or falls. He's not working for you. He's working for somebody else. You've got nothing to do with it. One person considers one today to be above another day. There's a hospital nearby, and it's a hospital that believes on worshiping on the Sabbath. I don't think two or three months goes by. That used to be much more frequent. Somebody would come on to program and want to start a conversation, a debate, and they would say, Pastor Barbara, on what day should we worship God? That one sentence, I know exactly who they are, where they come from, and where they're going, and what they attempt to accomplish with that one sentence. My answer is always the same every day. And if you would like to discuss it, since this is my program and I wasn't planning on discussing it, you can go open your own program. It's cheap. I'll help. I'll, it's free. I'll teach you how to do it. And you can have your own program. And you can discuss what you want to discuss on your program. It's just that simple. But there's going to be somebody that thinks they're doing a big thing by interrupting my program to discuss what they want to discuss and what they sincerely believe in. And when we get through with this big discussion, they are still going to want to worship God on the Sabbath and I'm still going to want to worship Him on Sunday. And these are good people. Because this hospital is nearby, I would say about a third to a half of the doctors in my medical group are from this hospital. And they are wonderful doctors, and they are good Christians. And we have so much respect for them, because I have a great deal of respect for anybody that lives their faith. And when I see them, uh, my cardiologist spends his vacations going around the world doing heart surgeries on other people. I just met Friday a really great ENT, knowledgeable kind, very uh, 
very nice person. I respect them. They respect me. I didn't know how to go about telling him, I know the Lord has led me and made me aware of certain things. Instead, I said, well, I'm one of these people that happens to be in the right place at the right time. In other words, I'm blessed. And he said, yeah, I know people like that. When I went to buy a house, I'd been in a trailer the whole time. I was an evangelist and a teacher. And I found a house. Well, I didn't have a down payment. But I felt like the Lord wanted me to buy this house. And I told the banker, I don't have a down payment now, but accept my guarantee that when the day comes that you need money, I'll have it then. How do you go about telling people that aren't of your faith, well, the Lord just led me, the Lord has told me, you know. He's, my banker said, yeah, I know people like you. <laughs> just, um, who are you to criticize in others? One person considers one day above another. Somebody considers every day to be the same. Whoever deserves the, the day observes it to the Lord. They're doing what they think is right. Whoever eats, eats to the Lord. They're doing what they think the Lord wants them to do. Since he gives thanks to God, and whoever does not eat, it's the Lord. It is to the Lord that he doesn't eat. If he doesn't eat meat offered to idols, then he doesn't eat meat offered to idols. It has nothing to do with you. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and came to life for this, that he might rule over both the living and the dead. But you, why do you criticize your brother? Now, you understand that I'm a Bible teacher. I teach what the Bible says. It's my responsibility to study and know what I'm talking about. It's not my responsibility to go around judging and not getting along with other believers because we differ. It is my job to teach what I believe to be truth and what I believe I'm supposed to be teaching and helping people with. But that is different from causing the distraction of arguments and debates. Do you criticize your brother? Or you? Do you look down on your brother? For it's written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. So what's this, you not getting along with your brother? First of all, are you going to change anybody by not agreeing with him? I don't think so. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. I better study. I better not open this book and tell you what I think will make you like me. If this was a church and we were taking an offering, I had better not be saying something because I want you to put more money in the plate when it comes by. I had better not let things like that affect my teaching. Um, every knee will bow. We'll all give account. Don't interpret things in the Bible to your satisfaction. That's not the same as studying to show yourself approved of God. The law of love. Therefore, let us no longer criticize one another 
but instead decide not to put a stumbling block or pitfall in your brother's way. I don't have to agree with you. But because I disagree with you doesn't give me the right to dig a hole and cover it up with leaves so that you're going to fall in it. For us to disagree with what we believe is one thing. For me to do nasty things because we disagree is another matter. Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one it's unclean. If you think you should not eat meat that's been offered to idols, guess what? You should not eat meat that's been offered to idols because for you it's unclean. For me, it's meat that's 50% cheaper. For you, it's meat that's unclean. For if your brother is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Let's say I went into a very small town and there was only one church. And a pastor had taught all of his people that they shouldn't eat hot dogs on Friday. And I come into this town, there's no place else for me to go to church and worship. And the people have a certain respect for me. Because I've studied the Bible, taught the Bible. So I tell his people, I, the great Bible teacher, the great Bible student, ate hot dogs on Friday. Now, if I eat hot dogs on Friday and keep my mouth shut about it and it's not hurting anybody, it's not a problem. Because God has never told me not to eat hot dogs on Friday. But I know a pastor is dealing with his congregation. I don't want to create a problem for him and for them. So I either won't eat hot dogs on Friday or I'll do it and keep my mouth shut or whatever. I don't need to make a problem for other people. Just because I'm free to do it doesn't mean I'm free to create a problem for other people. Still, to someone that believes something is unclean, to that one it is unclean. Walk according to love. Do not destroy that one for whom Christ died. He died for the person who believes differently than you. Therefore, don't let your good be slandered. If I do what for me is right, it's not just what I do, but it's the way I do it. I'm not going to do something in a way that's going to hurt somebody else. Why? For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not as it wine or grape juice for communion. It's not hot dogs versus fish on Friday like it was when I was a little kid growing up in the north. But the kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves the Messiah in the way that is acceptable to God and approved by man. So then, see, we didn't have hundreds and thousands of different denominations in the age of the apostles, the apostle Paul and the disciples of Jesus. We didn't have as much differences in those days as we do now, but we had them. Whoever serves the Messiah in this way is acceptable to God 
and approved by men. And I'm going to tell you, there have been times in my life that I was not aware of something before I understood about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand it. I'd been to Bible college. I'd been taught the opposite. And I'm reading in the Bible and I'm saying that's not what I was taught. The Holy Spirit can get a hold of my mind anytime he wants to. And he can deal with me. And that's between me and him. And when he does, I better change and I better do what he wants me to do. That doesn't mean I'm not going to get along with people who believe slightly different from me. Now, on the major issues, we agree. So then... We must pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Uh, I don't want to go into detail um, because you never know who's watching what. I've been known, told, I have made somebody into a better Catholic by my teaching. Is that a good thing or not a good thing? I'll leave that up to God. If somebody is living closer to God because they came to my Bible studies and followed my teaching and their priest says you're living closer to God now than you have before. Is that good? Is that bad? Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Well, I'm a big person. I'm a big deal. So I approve of you. I disapprove of you. Are you kidding? But whoever doubts stands condemned. If he eats because his eating is not from faith, and everything that is not from faith is sin, if you're doing it because you believe it's what God wants you to do, do it. But don't do something for some other reason. We have two more chapters. And I'm going to go halfway through one. That means that when I get through in a little bit, and I've been on for an hour and 28 minutes, so when I get through, we will be a chapter and a half from the end. That's what we'll do next Sunday night. And when we do that chapter and a half, where will we be? We will be in the book of Acts. See, Acts is where things are right after Jesus ascends into heaven. The disciples are told, go into the city of Jerusalem and wait until they're given power to do what God's told them to do. You've heard me talk about the what and how. The what. Jesus says, I'm going to be taken away from you. But go into the whole world and preach the gospel and make converts. Go into the whole world, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea. See, Jerusalem's a city. Judea was the tribe, the state, into the whole nation of Israel. That's the country. And in the whole world, start where you are and go into the whole world and preach the gospel. That's the what. Now comes the how. How are you going to manage that? Go into the city of Jerusalem and wait for the Father's promise. And you will receive power so that you'll be able to go into all the world, starting in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the whole world. 
That's the what and the how. The end of the Gospels tells us the what. The end of the Gospels and the beginning of the book of Acts tells us the what. The book of Acts gives us the details of how they carried this out. Okay. Jesus was taken into a cloud. Ten days before the Feast of Pentecost, they didn't know this was going to happen on a feast day. But it did. But they were in obedience. They were in the city of Jerusalem. They were waiting and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fell upon them. The book of Acts gives us all the details of what happened with the apostles. But then comes Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. All of these letters that give us the doctrine we need. As we're studying the book of Acts, all these letters, you know, we're studying the United Kingdom. We get all the details about the different kings. Now we're studying the divided kingdom on Wednesday. We're going to get all the details about the other kings. But in the background is the divided kingdom. Well, now we're in the age of the apostles. What the happens in the church, how we should be living, what we should be doing, what happened right after Christ's return. And then among them, we have all these letters. So we keep going back to the book of Acts. And when we get through with um, this chapter and a half, if I don't hurry, I'm not, maybe I won't even get a half, maybe just a few verses. So it'll probably be pretty close to two chapters. Now, we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. Some people are physically stronger. It's been a few years since the arthritis in my knees just ate up all the jelly around the joints. And I've got what they call bone on bone. And when I'm going upstairs, it can be a problem. But I have a girlfriend, and she's younger and stronger. And she just gives me that added boost if we're at the spa and I'm trying to get up out of the hot tub. She's stronger. She helps with that. Let me tell you, there's other areas in which I'm stronger. I'm older. I'm more experienced. So there comes a time when I must be the helper. And there's time when I am the receiver of help. We who are strong have an obligation to bear witness of those without strength and not to please ourselves. I have an obligation to teach those who need to be taught. Not because it makes me happy to do it, but because it's an obligation. In some areas, I have more strength than in others. Each one of us must please his neighbor for good in order to build him up. If I'm strong in an area, I need to help a person who is weaker in that area. For even the Messiah did not please himself. Jesus didn't come to earth to make himself happy. On the contrary, it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written before was written for our instruction. Somebody writes a book. I don't even know them. But maybe I need to read a book on what foods to eat that are better for arthritis. Or I need to know some information and it's in a book that somebody has written and I don't even know them and they wrote the book before I even knew they had a book. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. 
For whatever was written before was written for our instruction. So that through our endurance and through our and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we have hope. Because the Bible gives me hope. And people help me along the way. People I don't even know. Help me along the way. Now may the God of endurance, and this is a, a benediction that usually comes at the end of one of these books, but sometimes we get one at the end of a chapter or even in the middle of the chapter. And here we have one. Now may the God um, of endurance and encouragement grant you agreement with one another. That's a good benediction for a pastor to end the church service or for me to end a program. Instead, I usually say blessings on you or God bless you. Here's a blessing. Now may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you agreement one with another according to Christ Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ, with a united mind and voice. And that's a very good place to end. So let me put my little mark. That was the first six verses of chapter 15. We have about two pages, a little bit less. And we will finish with this, Lord willing, next Sunday evening. And we will be back then about the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. And we've gotten to the time that I end my program. So before I chat a little bit with the people in my live program, let me say to all of you, blessings on you until our next video.